Well, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. My name is Matt Brogdon. I'm the executive director of Hesperus, and I want to invite all of you, or sorry, I want to thank all of you for attending today's panel uh, sponsored by Hesperus with some uh, industry leading professionals uh, with issues concerning things that just are challenges and especially solutions in Native American communities. Uh, I want to focus today uh, around the digital divide. Our conversation is going to be with some leading experts and corporations around the country who are tackling this issue from the corporate perspective and delivering broadband and Wi Fi service to Native American communities. Hesperus is a nonprofit focused on education, employment, and technology solutions for Native American communities, including Alaska Natives, with a uh, strong focus around Native American veterans as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, my team, and I'd like to um, have every me each member of the panel introduce themselves as well. Uh, we're joined today by Charissa Wood, who is a member of my team, and has really been the source and focus for all those great LinkedIn and other social media posts you've seen, in addition to a lot of great public relations work. So I wanted to thank her today. And Mike Moreno, who will be joining us later, is uh, my technical expert and supports me in everything from Zoom calls to websites. So with that being said, I would like for the panel to introduce themselves. And we'll go through by alphabetical order, starting with Terry Davis. Thanks, Matt. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Terry Davis, and I uh, am with Comcast. I'm a senior director of external affairs and government affairs uh, out in Washington state uh, for the company. Um, I have been in the cable industry uh, going on 23 years. I've uh, been in the government affairs space for uh, going on about 18. And uh, I originally came in uh, and worked uh, in the construction realm for five years when we were uh, originally deploying our hybrid fiber coax system and, and bringing broadband uh, to the country. So uh, I've definitely been here uh, from kind of the beginning to uh, where we are now. Prior to Comcast and, and the cable industry, I actually uh, uh, worked in uh, the field of land use planning and uh, worked for the Umatilla Indian Reservation out of outside of Pendleton, Oregon as a land use planner doing everything from forest management to uh, reviewing their plans for their casino. So uh, that really uh, uh, provided me a great opportunity to learn more uh, about uh, the Indian country and, and uh, the uh, diversity that uh, comes with uh, working in that type of environment. So I'm uh, glad to be here and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Terry. And I'm glad Comcast is part of this conversation today. I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'll, I'll next turn it over to Scott Murray. We won't get into where you went to school, but I'm really glad that you're here today too. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. So yes, I'm. Uh, thank you all for attending. I'm Scott Murray. I am actually a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe. I grew up on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. And I left there after high school uh, to attend the United States Naval Academy. Sorry, Matt, I had to wind that in. And uh, since then, I spent uh, my early career as a uh, naval officer on board ships, um, in primarily in the engineering and operations departments. When I got out of the Navy, I then transferred into an IT technology career, starting out as an advanced technology consultant with Arthur Anderson. Uh, from there, I moved on to roles with the Coca-Cola company, with Dell, SunGuard Availability Services, and finally here at Microsoft. Um, one of the things that really excites me currently about the opportunities that we're on is, is number one, I'll, I'll put in a plug, we'll talk more about Microsoft specific initiatives shortly, but I'm, I'm proud to say that since I've joined Microsoft, we have gone and elevated our Native American, what was our Native American employee resource group from a national support network for our employees to a global network, which is now referred to as indigenous at Microsoft. And so we've expanded that globally. And so now we're seeing a lot of uh, heavy participation from uh, the other regions of the world, including African members, as well as uh, New Zealand and Australia as well. So, so kudos there. But what really interests me about the opportunity to speak now is when I left the reservation, there's a strong cultural tie where it's, it's in some sense an expectation that 
uh, when you leave the reservation, you pick up skills and you bring those back to your community to contribute. And in the course of my career, that just hasn't been an opportunity for me yet. But with these initiatives, driving broadband will open up those into my career field where hopefully I'm on that, just on the cusp of being able to actually fulfill that dream and go back and work and contribute in my community. Well, thanks, Scott, for joining us today. And I know we want to hear more about Microsoft's efforts in this area uh, and specifically the unique approach I think Microsoft is taking. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, have Rudy Reyes from Verizon introduce himself. Verizon's been a strong supporter for these talks, and uh, I really enjoyed working with them. I'm glad Rudy can join us as a first time panelist. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, yeah, I'm Rudy Reyes. Uh, I lead uh, state legal, regulatory, government affairs, and local engagement for Verizon in the Western United States. Uh, super happy to be here with this distinguished panel today to talk a little bit about uh, Verizon's commitment to tribal communities and rural communities uh, in America. A uh, little bit about myself uh, first. Uh, so I've been at Verizon for almost 20 years uh, doing started off doing regulatory work and then wound my way over more to the policy side uh, in addition to the legal side. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, quintessential problems in, um, in uh, telecommunications over the past uh, 20, 30 years has been how do we get more broadband out to more people and close that digital divide. Uh, and so I'm super excited to talk about uh, all the things that we're doing not only in tribal communities, but across America and in rural America to help solve that problem. Well, thanks for joining us again. And uh, last, but uh, that's just in this round, uh, John Sun from Phillips. Uh, I will say that John uh, agreed to sit on the panel the first time I ever talked to him. So I really appreciate his <laughs> exuberance to join us today. Thanks, John. You're welcome, and uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor to uh, to be here with uh, such a distinguished uh, panel. Um, so my name's Johnson. I'm the Vice President of uh, Indian Health Service and Rural Health for uh, Phillips, and I'm part of the Government Solutions uh, team. And uh, I've been with Phillips for about three years now, but before that, um, I supported the government and federal contracting for about 23 years. Uh, any, any uh, supporting anything from uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, Lockheed Martin, and uh, Honeywell uh, on the infrastructure side, and then uh, ultimately on the health side. But I also, right before I supported Phillips, I did support Bristol Bay Native Corporation out in Anchorage, and then also uh, Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. So uh, have supported uh, Indian Health Service for about uh, 13 years now, and uh, I was uh, very fortunate to actually go on some of the, to some of the reservations and talk to the elders and the leadership, um, and also uh, IHS uh, headquarter leadership. So um, my personal background, I uh, graduated with an architectural degree, so I designed a lot of uh, hospitals and clinics uh, and schools uh, that required infrastructure to support uh, virtual and, uh, um, and then ultimately being a management consulting and then now as a business development and vice president for Philip. So uh, looking forward to this discussion and healthy discussion because uh, it's, it's, it's that important for our native communities. So thank you, Matt. Well, again, thanks for joining all of you. I really appreciate your participation today and we're gonna get right to it. Uh, you know, NPR outlined an article a few years ago that unfortunately is sadly true today. Native American and Alaska Native communities are the least connected communities in the United States uh, in terms of broadband access. And according to the Digital Reservations Act, a, a piece of legislation put forward last year by Elizabeth Warren and Deb Holland, some of the research done on it um, showed that only 65% of Native Americans living on tribal lands have access to wireless service. Furthermore, this leaves about 1.5 million people on reservations without reliable broadband service. Uh, and you know, to John's point, 75% of rural Indian health service facilities 
do not have reliable broadband access for telehealth services. So a lot of the services that the rest of us take for granted that we just think we need to log on, including that you know, user-friendly guest broadband in our hospitals or in our stores, uh, this, none of these services are available to a large number of Native Americans in their own communities. What's really highlighted this issue for me, and I think what, why I wanted to bring it up in terms of Hesperus's mission is COVID has laid bare the lie that broadband access is even enough to get us through hard times. What was a, a luxury has become a necessity because of all these kids that have been home from school, all these folks that are isolated and been unable to leave their homes, and not to mention you know, access to things like healthcare and education for adults. So what we've seen is COVID kind of uh, showing us that all is not right. And we knew that nationally, but where it hit hardest, and not just in a healthcare sense, where it hit hardest has been in Native American communities and on these tribal reservations. Uh, people are accessing the internet through their mobile phones. They're pulling up cars to their nearest Taco Bell or Chick-fil-A and getting internet access there. They're parking next to their tribal headquarters to get internet access after hours. And they're trying to use the overflow broadband from things like elementary schools and libraries in order to access the internet. And these are people that are looking for jobs. These are people that are trying to get an education. Um, it shouldn't be this way. And I know there are a lot of people working on this. There are a lot of government uh, solutions. There are a lot of think tanks out there. The reason I wanted to convene this panel today is to talk about what corporate America is doing and the challenges they face, but also the solutions they can provide in order to help us all get to this broadband, uh, this ideal broadband state, right, where we all have access. Um, I think one of the biggest things that illustrates the issue in this area is that even the U.S. Census Bureau and the FCC put out different numbers in terms of broadband coverage for tribal reservations, right? Our own national government puts out uh, different numbers and inconsistent information depending on who you talk to. Uh, we all know that can be true across a number of different areas. I think it's especially true in when we're dealing with Native American communities, when we can't get our basic numbers right, how are we supposed to support this population the way we need to? So uh, there have been a lot of discussion from the CARES Act. There's been a lot of discussion for the latest COVID bill. I, yeah, the USDA has had a broadband infrastructure fund that was depleted a couple of years ago. In other words, there's been investment in this area. There's been a lot of attention in this area. But most importantly, I think uh, the public-private partnership, the needs of corporations to lean forward in this area to address some of these issues has been highlighted now more than ever before, especially since COVID is, has visited us. Um, so I wanna take a chance, uh, an opportunity today and start with each of our panelists to talk about the initiatives they're focused on uh, in their companies to address this issue. From there, we'll spring to some other discussion points. I especially want to relate it back to the opportunity for tribal leaders and native communities at the end of this. But really, uh, right now, I'd really like to have each of our companies talk about the specific efforts they've made in this area, some, so, some challenges they face, both within the native community as well as within their own corporations, and then uh, the solutions for particular problems that they've come up with. I think it's it's important for all of us to understand this isn't a new problem and a lot of these folks have been working on this for a long time. So with that, I'm gonna ask Terry to talk about Comcast's efforts in this area and discuss what's going on in 2021. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, you know, for Comcast, we are one of the, uh, the, the larger uh, companies that are offering video broadband uh, phone services across uh, the country. We we do uh, stretch from East Coast to West Coast. Um, so, you know, for us, uh, for tribal broadband and how to uh, how to approach tribal broadband, first off, it's through partnership. Uh, we recognize that uh, the tribes, every tribe is unique. Um, they are going to have their own community needs uh, specific to broadband. So we want to make sure that we're listening and leading uh, uh, there first so that we can identify what their needs are. Now, we have a lot to bring to the table. Um, we can help expand our 
uh, services, if that's if we are close to their reservation and their tribal lands, uh, to bring our services uh, to uh, to their residents or to their business uh, and enterprises. Um, we also serve existing reservations. I know here in Washington State of the 29 federally recognized reservations, we serve 13. So we ha we have a presence uh, with them where in uh, you know our Xfinity products are there or our Comcast business products or smart city technology is, is readily available for them. I think the big thing is probably just making sure that they're aware that we are willing to partner. Um, one of our greatest programs that we've really invested in over the last 10 years has been our digital adoption and digital equity uh, program called Internet Essentials. Now, this came about to originally to uh, uh, bridge the digital divide. It's a comprehensive, holistic, uh, research-based program that addresses uh, the cost of service at the home, providing a, a low-cost a piece of equipment for a computer if the family doesn't have a computer, but also tackling the digital equity um, or the, the digital literacy training. Uh, some people don't know what to do on the internet. They don't feel safe on the internet. So, you know, through over this uh, last 10 years, we have connected more than 8 million people uh, to this program. 90% had never connected before. We've uh, issued out over 100,000 pieces of, of, uh, com of computers and invested over $700 million in uh, literacy training. Those numbers sound great, but the problem still exists. And COVID uh, really highlighted that and challenged us um, to relook at our program and say, we can do more. And so I'm really proud of what Comcast did in that space of, of opening up a, you know, the first two months for free uh, for low-income families that needed a connection. We've, we have continued to boost speeds throughout COVID to address the, the connection need for more video conferencing. We have partnered with different entities. So uh, we know that people struggle with uh, still uh, for the $10 a month, but there are entities out there, schools, chambers, different nonprofits that said, we, we would like to pay for uh, those families and help them out. So we developed a internet essentials partnership agreement, but we still know that there's people that are struggling with the connection. And our focus right now is on lift zones. Um, this is really connect, bringing a, a high powered Wi-Fi uh, service into safe community spaces so that distance learning can happen. And uh, you know, that connection to critical community resources can happen over the internet uh, because folks may not have a home, or maybe they do have internet essentials at home, but their parents are working and they need to go to a daycare. So we're very focused on, on this. In the uh, uh, Indian, uh, uh, amongst the Indian uh, community, we're currently working on uh, 21 sites. We have three active and we're working to connect another 18 uh, across our footprint in, uh, you know, with, uh, with tribes. So you know, again, it comes back to we're willing to partner. We have some great programs but we wanna to listen to what their needs are because we know that they're unique and we're uh, here ready to help. Thanks, Terry. Has first has been fortunate to work with Comcast on a, identifying some of those folks. And I know you all are hard at work, um, you and your colleague, Rebecca Gray, to identify even more. And so if there are folks that are on this um, uh, panel or not on the panel that are in the audience that are interested in learning more or that uh, maybe have some ideas around that, please reach out to me and I'd be glad to connect you. Um, so uh, I, I just learned of the Airband Initiative at Microsoft a few years ago. I'm really proud because I do a lot of work with Microsoft and I focus on them. But I, Scott, I'd love to hear what Microsoft is doing in this space and how they've kind of changed course the last few years. Absolutely. So again, at Microsoft, our mission statement is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And so that especially extends to those most remote, most underserved people on the planet. And so when we look at that, the uh, issues around connectivity holistically, um, it really requires looking at it from a, what's the right tool in an application based on the situation and scenario. And so uh, just 
in terms of getting broadband communications out to people, we have to look at the different mechanisms and tools that can drive those out there. And so the Microsoft Airband initiative is really about ex exposing and expanding and developing what's called the, the TV white space area. And so that is taking those unused parts of the broadband spectrum or of the spectrum of the, of the broadcast spectrum that are uh, generally reserved for UHF and VHF television and driving technologies, driving implementations to get that out because that serves a niche that is particularly useful and applicable in Indian country, which is those longer haul, more spread out communities where we can drive up the bandwidth using those um, whereas those that are extremely remote are, mo are generally best suited by uh, satellite and those that are internal are, are, uh, are you know, more apt to be clustered in areas where, a, uh, you know, where, they, where the wireless uh, broadcasts work for them. Um, so what our goal in the Airband Initiative is, since 2018, we set the goal to actually partner to extend broadband access to at least 3 million people in unserved rural communities by July 4th of 2022. And at those top levels, how we expect to do that is number one, help our airband partners to obtain public funding to develop and expand and, and, and deploy the technologies. We also were looking as, as advocates to do more accurate mapping of what broadband access really looks like. So do we really understand the impacts and, and the mapping of who's impacted and, and who's most isolated. And then finally, we're looking to drive through, uh, through legislature and through the public sector uh, to drive progress towards favorable regulations on, frequently, on the frequency spectrum um, so that we can in fact open up those unused spectrums and, and make those available to be consumed on the reservation. The way that we're doing this is we currently have 12 projects going in 12 states. And uh, we're driving these projects through, number one, co-investment with uh, partners in broadband deployments in, in the TV white space. Um, we're also looking to help drive royalty-free access to TV white space patents, as well as uh, TV white space source code. Um, we're advocating and encouraging the FCC to ensure that there is sufficient TV white space available nationwide. Um, again, we're looking to influence uh, public sector funds, you know, matching grants, loans, and so on for network operators to give them the opportunity to actually take that, share those investments, and make these technologies available in those under, underserved spaces. Um, Going back to what Mike, uh, what Matt said earlier around, we're not sure what the data really tells us. Another significant effort we have aligned with our airband initiative is actually data rationalization so that we can actually improve the data and understand that rural bed, broadband data. And then finally, when we bring these things together, where we really wanna converge them is that, again, going back to that mission, empowering every person, is what is incumbent upon the technology delivery is our efforts to increase the digital skills for people at all ages. No, and I think that echoes what Terry said earlier about that investment in the individual user. And I think that's probably as much as anything else, the most necessary uh, instruction and training that's needed by all ages in these rural communities. Uh, I was on the San Carlos Apache Reservation last week and we talked about having equipment and broadband access, but then we also talked about training on how to use that equipment and use that the software. Uh, everything as simple as a Google search uh, to find a job, right? So at the end of the day, it's about teaching folks uh, from the ground up. And again, a lot of us are, are have dealt with this our entire lives. Um, it's a first world uh, condition, but for many people, they're in a really in a third world state in terms of their broadband access and their digital skilling. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, 
So I'd, I'd like for Rudy to talk a little bit about what Verizon is doing. Uh, I've learned a lot from Kule and uh, Rudy's team over at Verizon about their involvements and efforts in this area down to brass tacks. They're very knowledgeable. So I'd love to hear what uh, Verizon is doing in this space and, and where they're headed. Well, thanks so much, uh, Matt and Scott and Terry. Uh, I want to highlight something that you said, Matt. You talked about a partnership. And that Verizon strongly believes that it's going to take a close and strong partnership between government and industry to really close the digital divide. Um, we, we see the digital divide as really uh, falling into three areas. We, we need to increase access to broadband. We need to increase broadband affordability. And we need to increase broadband adoption which is what uh, some of the panelists have been uh, talking about earlier. Um, I'm very proud that Verizon is you know, the best, the largest in terms of coverage and the most reliable wireless provider in America, including in rural America and tribal communities. So we've really put our money where our mouth is in terms of trying to expand broadband access, but we need more. Like uh, this is really an all of the above problem. Uh, while we're very proud of the investments that we've made, we do need a, a very close partnership with government because there are areas that are just so remote that it is on the margins of that business case. And it's where we work very hard every day to try to push the case over into a build case for, uh, for tribal communities. Uh, one specific thing I really uh, wanted to highlight is uh, you know, Scott was talking about spectrum earlier, hugely important. And, you know, it's, it goes to this quintessential last mile problem in telecommunications. How do we get broadband to the last mile? Well, radio frequency spectrum and wireless really offers a great deal of possibility. So last week, the Federal Communications Commission uh, announced uh, the results of its C-band or mid-band spectrum auction. And uh, Verizon uh, really bet big on, on C-band. Um, we, uh, uh, we announced uh, over $53 billion in capital uh, expenditures uh, to deploy the C-band that we won in that recent uh, auction, uh, contiguous from coast to coast. And especially in rural America, we uh, we we uh, gained a large number of megahertz uh, in uh, many markets in rural America that we're very excited to deploy. What that means, practically speaking, is uh, it will massively increase the capacity of our existing deployments. And again, Verizon is the largest by uh, by coverage area in these uh, across America, including in rural and tribal communities. So by increasing the capacity. What today uh, a tribal member might, uh, might have one or two bars on their phone. They might, if they travel too far outside of the zone, the call might drop, it might be spotty. We'll be able to massively expand the size of that pipe, the capacity, and be able to deliver much more reliable connectivity, including fixed wireless access or home or small business broadband, where you're able to install a node uh, on your home or small business and be able to get uh, fixed broadband to your home or small business. That's an absolute game changer for the digital divide where you know most people uh, really only have the option of the incumbent telephone company, the incumbent cable company. Here you have a third option or, or in, in, in rural and tribal communities, perhaps the only option for broadband connectivity. So we're very excited about the results of that of that auction. Fantastic, Rudy. And I know, I think it's that retail, that last mile, right? Figuratively, figuratively and literally that really matters because that's where the user, the end user is. Um, so uh, I wanted John from Philips to be on today because we talk a lot about carriers. We talk a lot about folks that deliver, but now I would like to talk about services provided and why broadband is so important uh, for particular companies, uh, not to deliver it, but to use it and to help these communities. And I thought uh, there's no more important industry or really service that we provide than healthcare. So I appreciate John being on here. I'd love to know what Philips is doing in this area. 
Sure. Thanks, Matt. Man, how do I follow these three uh, gentlemen? But uh, I'll try. But uh, so at Philips, uh, most of you know Philips as TVs and light bulbs. And uh, so I want everyone to understand that uh, Philips have divested everything but healthcare. So when we say and when you hear Philips now, it has everything to do with healthcare. So, um, you know, our CEO uh, a few years back was uh, interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, and uh, we are now being audited by Wall Street Journal because we are a publicly traded company that he stated in an interview that we will improve the lives of 3 billion people by the year 2030. And we're being audited by that statement. So every employee, every staff uh, in, it, under this corporation globally, that's what we're striving to do. So what does that mean? So at Philips, um, we have an enterprise telehealth solution uh, that pretty much supports the entire healthcare continuum from acute care to ambulatory care or home care. And uh, that healthcare is basically now is an ecosystem because you could pretty much go into an ecosystem anytime, anywhere versus walking into a physical hospital at the front door. Um, we have uh, solutions that could work either in low comms or to no comms at all. Uh, and, and we are supporting the warriors out in theater, uh, you know, uh, God forbid, but if they get shot up and blown up, um, you know, we have solutions that could collect that data. And then once it gets some kind of uh, comms, it will transmit that data to the, uh, um, the uh, trauma care, trauma center, or to the, uh, the medic. Um, we also have uh, an ATLAS program, and ATLAS is basically an acronym for accessing telehealth through local areas and stations. So this is mainly for the rural population of the, our veterans. Uh, this pod, if you will, about the size of a, uh, a tow booth, probably a little bigger than a tow booth, um, it could literally sit anywhere from a v VFW to a, uh, a drugstore to a community center. But literally, this is giving access to healthcare for those veterans and to those veterans. Um, and uh, it, it is just an incredible. So uh, since inception about a, a year ago, we have six active sites. And, and all six active sites are very rural areas of this country. Um, we also have a product called EICU. So we know that even before the pandemic, uh, we know that, uh, um, you know, the 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 typical bedside support is not efficient. So why not centralize it? And uh, so that way an intensivist or uh, someone who is behind the EICU uh, command center could literally monitor and manage up to a hundred uh, patients in, in this uh, capability. And uh, it really released the intensivist uh, led team and, uh, uh, and actually uh, it could give the capability of uh, reaching more intensivists, which, which Indian Health Service is lacking. Uh, we know that staffing shortage has been huge even before the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, uh, I truly believe that this type of uh, solution would, would really support them. Um, but along the continuum uh, that's kind of aligned with Indian Health and the population health uh, in the native communities, we have sleep and respiratory uh, solutions uh, that really could uh, improve behavioral and mental health and substance abuse. We have remote patient monitoring. We have a little sticker that uh, you put on, you could uh, stick onto your body, and it could really monitor uh, you know COVID symptoms down to the uh, not only the type of cough uh, but the frequency of cough. And um, uh, and then we are using the same technology for vaccine ma management because now it could detect. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, adverse uh, 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 symptoms or, or side effects of the various vaccines. So, you know, we also down to, I, I joke about it all the time, but, you know, most of us, most of you guys know us by the sonic toothbrush. I hope everyone has one. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the more expensive model even comes with a mobile app. So it really teaches young men and women and kids how to brush better. But, you know, people could laugh about that, but that data is, uh, is vital for oral hygienists because you know, it, it helps with oral hygiene, but also we all know that bad uh, um, oral hygiene leads to um, heart disease. So it's now a total solution, not just for your mouth, but for your heart. 
So this is everything that we're trying to do and trying to really innovate. Uh, and uh, through uh, even before the pandemic, we have a, you know, most of our solution has a teleplay or a virtual play. But really the three gentlemen before me is, you know, that's why it's so important for us to work with them because without that connectivity, most of our stuff won't work or uh, it won't work until that product has some connectivity. So uh, we're here to improve the lives. We're here to, to, to support Indian Health Service and the native communities through our government affairs team. And uh, we're working with various senators and caucuses and really working with the elders and that uh, we, you know, we're, we're here to help. And, and to uh, Ruta's point, we're, 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 you know, we like to be a long-term partner in this because we do want to improve the lives of the native community. So, um, so uh, thanks for having me and uh, welcome any questions that you guys may have. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm sure John will include a link later in the chat window so you can pick up that toothbrush at a store near you. I'm sure he's gonna provide us with that. So, um, we all know that uh, coverage isn't what it's supposed to be, and there are a lot of underlying reasons for that, but I'm gonna throw a curveball to the panel. Uh, I'll start with you, Scott, so I'm giving you uh, plenty of warning. And that is, um, there are some significant obstacles, you know, whether they're corporate or, or, or cultural uh, toward bridging this divide. And I wanna ask each of you, and I'll ask Scott first, and then uh, if you all just wanna join in when you can, what has been a significant obstacle you've seen in the corporate space to uh, helping bridge the digital divide. And I'm not necessarily asking about a, a, you know, a will problem. Oh, we don't think this is important, but more about, you know, is it resources? Is it uh, legislation? Is it, you know, just there's so much on our plates and things we have to do. Uh, you know, I'd like to know uh, what you've seen from an obstacle perspective uh, that you've had to overcome, you know, both individually and as a, a corporation. Scott, you want to start us on that? Yeah, so absolutely. So the first, the first piece from a from a corporate perspective, it has, has really been the necessity to go through and, and change or get approvals through the various regulatory bodies to open up the spectrum in the specific area where we're trying to go. So that's so that's been the number one challenge. The number two challenge again is that uh, while there while there is data out there, the data is disparate. And it is also conflicting. And so the second challenge has been actually ag collecting and aggregating data rich enough to allow us to really make decisions in a more, more focused manner to make sure that we're addressing what we really expect to address. Um, there's, again, there are, just, there are disparities between uh, the numbers and the studies based on the samples, the location of the samples and those kinds of things. All of these are valid studies, but there's we just need more, and more equates to resources, both human and material, to to drive those uh, pieces to get us the whole solution. So, Scott, would you say that that's data that you all need to come up with at Microsoft, or is that also government data, or is it a hybrid? What what are you talking it's, about? It, it's it is the hybrid. So, what we really need to do is create an ecosystem where partners, entities, governments are sharing their data, collecting it into a, a, a large repository where we can then turn loose some of the powerful technology tools to mine and build models to help us make smarter decisions and accelerate the ability to deploy technology to the underserved people. You know, I would agree we need better data across the board on Native American communities, not just in the broadband area. I absolutely agree. Who else? Yeah, yeah Matt, I would point out that uh, um, I go back to the access piece of the access, affordability, and adoption. So uh, private investment has, uh, you know, by the speakers that have spoken today, has led us, you know, 95, 96% of the population to have broadband coverage. But like I mentioned earlier, there are, there are gonna be those cases on the margins where uh, we're gonna need government to help with infrastructure spending in order to get us all the way there. And uh, there was a great piece in the Hill today. I was just looking, I wasn't multitasking. I was looking it up on the Hill today by Lindsay Lewis, 
how to bridge the digital divide without widening partisan divides. It was really calling upon Congress to use and focus this infrastructure funding wisely to really target those unserved areas. Don't make the same errors of the past where limited funds are, are used to overbuild areas, for example, uh, and, and to work in partnership with industry. Like you say, the will is there, but we all need help getting that business case from the, um, the margins make all the difference, right? I, I'm not talking about the profit margins. I'm talking about margin, you're know, right on the margin of getting it approved for build. We need to get more projects approved. And that means more cooperation with tribal communities uh, and more help from Congress. Yeah, amen to that. And um, I always go back to the, the movie, Jerry Maguire, help me so I can help you. So the, uh, the fact that uh, I can't speak for the broadband issue, but I can speak for the healthcare issue that requires broadband. And, uh, I'm working with Lumination right now. And Lumination is a population of 5,000 in the state of uh, Washington. Um, because of the pandemic, um, about 70% uh, of their visits uh, at their clinic is all virtual, but 50% of those visits, they have to take it in their car because they have to drive to a hotspot. That's just not right. And uh, so, so we're working with, with several of the individual tribes, but if you just go back and step a little higher is, I think is the culture, is the culture of Indian Health Service as an agency that uh, it, it's, it's really, they need to look at in the mirror and, and, and really say to themselves, you know, how are they supporting them? Yes, the budget is very low year after year, but how can they think outside the box and really give the community a sustainable approach? Yeah, Rudy actually stole my thunder uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we, we do need to focus on the unserved areas first. If, if this uh, you know, even though it seems like there's a lot of money and there is a lot of money out there, this is a one-time uh, kind of influx of, of funds and uh, public funds are scarce. And let's, let's be smart uh, about how we uh, uh, plan for that. And let's not, uh, let's not just end up in a situation where we're overbuilding a very highly competitive marketplace already. Now, I'd, I'd like to kind of switch your, your uh, topic uh, because I had firsthand knowledge of building out uh, to a tribal nation uh, here in Washington state recently, and we're about ready to uh, kind of kick off uh, the activation of that project. Um, you know, the making sure that we have the utility poles ready uh, from a make ready perspective so that we can deploy quickly is a, is a, is a critical item uh, to making sure that we uh, have streamlined uh, regulations there. But also probably from the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs perspective, um, on tribal lands, making sure that um, they're doing, you know, kind of holistic uh, right of entry agreements to allow for communication power uh, and broadband at the same time, so that we are not having to go redo uh, easements on top of, you know, power and uh, maybe phone from uh, 20 years ago, uh, so that we have a pathway and we can get to those uh, tribal homes a lot faster. You know, for, from our perspective, it's really, um, you know, the tribes need to know where they want to go. Um, the uh, the muffle shoots who we worked with, they had done their homework. They had studied, uh, they knew the cost of what it would be uh, to build out their own fiber system. And th that was not of interest to them to duplicate and to have to uh, have that long-term burden of coming up with maintenance cost and the cost of innovating. Um, and they looked at, at Comcast uh, and they said, you know, you're the subject matter expert in this field. You're continuing uh, to invest and innovate. Um, we'll invest with you to deploy uh, because you'll have our best interests at heart to continue to evolve your systems uh, to meet our anticipated needs of the future. And I think that, that right there is a great example of that uh, you know, that partnership uh, approach to solve a problem for them um, and, uh, you know, solve their, their broadband uh, needs, so. Well, Terry, you, you segued right into my next question, which is, uh, on the other hand, uh, 
if I'm a tribal leader or I am, uh, you know, my, my tribe has done its due diligence, done research, and has decided to invest in a network or let's, like we've seen some, an example in New Mexico, a group of Pueblos has built an infrastructure network uh, amongst themselves. But if I'm a tribal leader, what do I need to be thinking about? What do I need to have squared away if I want to, if I come into uh, some funding, some investment, and I want to approach a company and say, can you help me with this? What are some things I need to think of before I do that? And I'm going to ask uh, Rudy to start, uh, but I'd love for everybody to chime in. Yeah, thanks, uh, Matt. So, you know, we really want to work with tribal communities. Kule on my team, it's it's uh, one of her main jobs is to liaison with all the tribal nations uh, uh, here to work with them to get those build cases that are on the margins over the line. And I think the biggest uh, uh, thing that tribal communities can do, you know, I think as, as Terry mentioned is, uh, is to um, uh, be prepared, be responsive, uh, be, be ready to move, uh, have a plan, um, have that open line of communications uh, and, you know, realize that, uh, that, that, we, that, we, uh, that we need to work in partnership together to try to make this, you know, a build case. And I would also pivot uh, to say, uh, you know, I read in the uh, newspaper, I think in CNN, that in, in Oklahoma, it was the tribal nations that came together to allow the COVID vaccine to be given to every resident in Oklahoma regardless of tribal status. That's the type of partnership, we're all in this together. I, I, I would also, so I'm, I'm pivoting to, uh, in addition to getting that critical build on tribal communities, tribal communities play a huge role with respect to permitting and build all across America. Because of uh, NEPA review and other things, uh, tribal communities play a role with pretty much every cell site that is deployed across America. And we have seen because of COVID very understandably some uh, slowdowns in terms of NEPA approval. So I think there's ways that we can help each other to eliminate barriers, eliminate inefficiencies and increase that uh, approval process. I think that will also help not only tribal communities but, but, but really everyone. I'll throw it open to Scott and John. Yeah, so I'll I'll chime in. I, I think one of the things is if we as Native Americans and especially tribal governments take an introspective look, if there's one thing that we learned from Cobell, the Cobell uh, settlement and those kinds of things is that it is incumbent upon us to be responsible for our destinies. And so when we start talking about the partnerships here, that means that as tribal governments, as tribal communities on the reservations and elsewhere, uh, we have a responsibility to ourselves and to, and to the members of our tribal communities to do the due diligence and to ensure that we're setting the platform to be effective partners in these relationships as well. So it's, we, we've been burned in one sense before by trying to hand over the keys, if you will, to a larger solution and look for the benefits. We know that we have to insert ourselves, educate ourselves, and be a active partner in this partnership to deliver these services. Yeah, and you know, I, I keep going back to when and how I met some of the, uh, the Bristol, Bristol Bay native uh, elders and tribal leaders and Cherokee is that uh, there's that sense of acceptance that that barrier of acceptance needs to be broken and, and that acceptance how you break it is through trust and through partnerships uh, like everyone else is saying and it's not just you know uh, for, for for phillips it's not just the uh, the healthcare um, agencies. It's, it's the agencies. It, it, it includes FCC. It includes Department of Education. And it's, it's, you know, if you talk about a true private public partnership, Matt, the way you started this, uh, this uh, panel, a true private public partnership is not just 
um, a, a industry collection of consortium of companies, but it's also a consortium of government. So it starts with Indian Health Service, but down to the local tribes and or if you uh, one level above that is the areas, but it's also the state and local government, but it's also FCC is also, you know, uh, HHS and, 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 and everyone in, be, in between because, um, you know, the disparity is so big, not one agency, not one industry is going to solve this, but it really goes back to, you know, is the acceptance and the trust first. So how do we get that dialogue first to get the private public partnership dialogue in a more creative, but more in a robust way that there is gonna be next steps instead of just talk, so. Yeah, I think it's, uh, to boil it down, it's a lot harder than just putting up a cell tower, right? It's a lot harder than just putting up um, a satellite link or, or what is it uh, or what have you. There's going to be a lot of factors involved, a lot of players, and everyone has a say, right? Sometimes, you know, and I've talked with uh, each of you, and I've also talked with members of your companies, sometimes someone has a say, and then two years later, someone new at the tribe has a say, or someone new at the corporation has a say, and I've seen how that's played out as well. This is a long strategic process. This takes a lot of players, and it also takes consistency of of really of communication and action in order to make this successful. What I'm encouraged by is one, with the events of last summer and, and what's carried through with COVID is the attention being paid to the health and the disparities that we find, the inequities we find in Native American communities. And, in, and the reverse is also true. The, the desire for investment in these communities for a number of areas, you know, not just broadband, but also for healthcare and um, a number of other uh, areas. Um, and and I, I like to think that um, this time we have a little more momentum. You know, I'm not gonna be um, ridiculous enough to say this time it's different, especially with the history of the United States with this community. But I do wanna say, I, I do feel momentum and I, I, you know, I see it here on this panel and I see it with a lot of folks in government roles as well. I wanted to open the floor to a question or two before we ended. I haven't seen any in the chat. I'd like to invite anyone who has a question to ask one um, before we, we end the panel today and uh, you know, close out. If, so if anybody has any questions for our panelists, that'd be great. Now's the time or forever hold your peace. Or John's gonna start selling us another product. I'm kidding. Okay, um, I don't see, sorry, I see somebody, go ahead. Hey, Marty. Hi, I'm glad to be here and it's pretty informative. And I, um, I just wanna say that um, um, I work for Colorado River Indian Tribes and we kind of stumbled onto the spectrum. Um, broadband is new to us. So we're starting out uh, looking for money. We, we, we've, I've been tasked to write a grant. So we were looking, um, CRIT is located in Arizona and California. So we're looking for the first grant is California money, uh, the CP, uh, CPUC. Um, and I believe there's tribal broadband money. I believe there's like a billion dollars. So um, hearing all you guys talk, it, it's 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 um, it's 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 look something to look forward to. Um, I've had a lot of questions and um, had some times where I'd wake up and say, you know, I, I'm wondering if we're doing the right thing. How are we? You know, I know it's going to get big. It seems like the spectrum. Once we get to that point, it's going to be kind of like the casinos to the, to, to the tribes. Uh, it's 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 something that's going to take off. There's going to be a lot of other things that come along with it. Um, so um, for me, for one of the things that it seems like I would like to ask is, um, so we kind of wanted to shoot for fiber wireless and satellite. Is that too much for somebody that's just starting out? 
So uh, Matt, if you don't mind, Marty, I, um, so uh, first off, let me, uh, let me encourage you to reach out to Kule on my team. Like I, you know, obviously I can't commit right now that, that we would be able to um, help uh, with specific funding, but we certainly have a lot of experience working with the California PUC. We're very familiar with the uh, Advanced Services Fund, I believe you're referring to in that state. Um, you know, I also mentioned the, um, the C-band uh, where uh, auction or earlier, where, where we're looking to really uh, expand out in our capacity. So I think that, you know, even if the business doesn't land with Verizon, you know, our commitment and partnership to tribal communities is strong and we would welcome your reaching out. And if there's anything we can do, even if it's to introduce you to the people at the commission or, or, uh, or whatever, we would be happy uh, to do that. No, thank you. We, we have um, just really quickly, we, we partnered with, uh, we have um, nonprofit that's we're working with uh, part of California, uh, MuralNet, and um, we brought on um, Geeks, uh, Geeks Without Frontiers. So we we have two um, nonprofits that we're working with. Um, looking forward to, you know, working with them. Um, we have Geo, Geo uh, Partners out of Minnesota, and. Um, it's I, guess I believe Geeks is kind of like a global uh, nonprofit, so we are kind of working with uh, those three partners. Uh, we're I kind of see us as a small team. We're starting out, and I kind of want to see exactly. Um, you know, I, I'm glad I'm, I'm stumbling onto some things. I'm stumbling onto um, advice, and I'm stumbling onto webinars like this and edu education. Ed, ed, educating myself, educating uh, the direction, and 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 kind of wondering sometimes exactly. I know that there's going to be, um, it's it's going to be. It seems like it's going to it's 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 big, and and where are we go with this and how we get to that point, um, uh, it's it's going to be a good thing. I. You know, so we have a for my team here at Crit. There's only four of us, and um, maybe maybe that's maybe that's big enough. Who knows? But, um, but it's uh, educational. And right now, I look at everything as education and going forward with it. And so I, I'm I'm glad I'm, I'm glad we're kind of where we're right where we're at. Well, Marty, I'd encourage you. I put my email address in the chat window. It's mattb at hesper.us. Please reach out to me and um, I can connect you with people on the panel. Uh, and I throw that out to everybody. I don't want to bombard our panelists with uh, uh, a lot of emails that come in at different times, but I would love to connect you uh, for some of that help that Rudy offered. Um, you know, we want to be a resource as well as an information uh, source as well. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So we're coming up on time. And uh, what I would encourage everybody, if you have further questions or thoughts uh, or ideas around this, um, some things you want to know, you know, I definitely see a need in the in the uh, community for more information around how do we get broadband access, both at a corporate level, a, a tribal level, as well as at an individual level. And so I think there's room for another panel here. That's a threat, not a promise, everybody. But uh, I did want to have the, everyone have a chance to say uh, a quick minute about them and their company and what they're doing. I'd just like to close this out with each of our panelists. I'm going to start with John. You surprised me there, Matt, because I now I have to look for a mute button. But no, I, I, uh, I am honored to to be part of this discussion. It's a very important uh, discussion. It's not uh, something that uh, uh, you hear a lot about, but uh, uh, I am uh, honored to be part of this panel. Uh, I look forward to working with the panel and also with some of you uh, in this audience is to really uh, bridge this gap in uh, disparity because uh, they need it. So, uh, so honored to be here. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, John. Uh, Scott. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much. I will have to admit that I've been humbled being allowed to serve on this panel with 
my colleagues. Um, I've learned so much in the aspects of that. Um, what I really look forward to though is just realizing the opportunity that lays in front of us. And I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and being involved in that large body of work that it's gonna take for us to get there. Thanks again. Fantastic, we'll do it together, Scott. I, I know that uh, you and Heather and Adonis and all those folks at Microsoft have big plans. So I appreciate you being here tonight. Rudy? Well, thank you, Matt, and, and everyone on the panel. It's been a great honor to speak uh, to you all today. Uh, I, you know, like, uh, like Scott said, I agree. I think we're on the cusp of something. You know, we, we shouldn't be making too big promises, especially with the history that we face, as Matt no noted. Uh, but I do feel we're on the cusp of some, some big changes and I'm really excited about that. In the chat, I've put uh, Verizon does have a tribal landing page with information. So Marty, please check it out, everyone. Uh, we try to put all the information we can there about our build out and our work with tribal communities. So thank you again for allowing me to speak to you today. Excellent. Terry. All right. Well, I guess I'm uh, last but not least. But uh, no, I'm honored uh, to be able to represent Comcast uh, here today. Um, it's an exciting subject. Uh, it's, it's right for the time and the opportunity. Um, and let's uh, work together uh, to uh, see what we can do. Comcast is committed to, to uh, finding solutions uh, where, where we can. Um, and I think that's why we invest in uh, Hesperus and uh, because we know that you can help us find those uh, folks that, that are in need uh, so that we can listen and uh, build a partnership if it works for them. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the support from our panelists and the, the knowledge here. This isn't a group that I can just convene at the drop of a hat. So I really appreciate everyone making time today to become a part of this. But more importantly, this is going to be posted on our website. We'll send this out to everybody as soon as we have it edited. And then I want it to be a resource, a starting point, if you will, like uh, Marty talked about, uh, to get started and get smarter. Um, I look forward to more uh, discussions around a lot of these technical issues. You know, Hesperus is focused on education, employment, and technology for Native Americans, creating opportunities to participate and excel in the 21st century digital economy. That's what we're all about. Our first program, the Summit Program, is designed to teach IT, IT skills training to Native American veterans after they get out of the service. We'll launch that this fall. And I encourage everyone here to follow us on LinkedIn, uh, on our Hesperus page on LinkedIn, or you can go to uh, my uh, LinkedIn page, and you'll see some posts from Hesperus there and get the page there. But please follow us. And uh, last but not least, I just want to say thank, thank you for taking time out of your Thursday uh, to spend it with us. And again, thanks to all our panelists. All right. Good night. Thanks, everybody. thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you. Bye.